one with the Lord is not only baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and having the Holy Ghost. That's, that's not one with him. Saved in spirit, but not in soul or body. For God hath perfected forever them by the blood of Jesus to them that are sanctified once and for all by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ paid for everything on the cross. Every season in your life, as well as the body of Christ, has already been paid for. And the blood cannot be disannulled. You've got three different seasons in your life, which is the same three seasons that's in the body, the church. Those three seasons that you will see, if you look at Leviticus 23, verse 5, in the 14th day, we'll take a look at verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord. They're not the feast of Israel. They're not the feast of the church. These are feasts of the Lord. Now, I'm going to do this message as a prelude to the communion service next week. Somebody said, why aren't we doing it now? Well, because some are fearful. Don't think they can drink of it worthily. It's not on your merit that you do it. It is a subjection. It is a subjection to the will of Jesus, not on your merit. You can't be holy enough. You can't dress holy enough. You can't be holy enough to warrant the blood of Jesus. You can't dress holy enough. You can't sanctify yourself holy enough to be worthy of Jesus. It's impossible. The only one that's worthy is the Lamb of God. No man in heaven nor in earth was found worthy. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. To have life and to have it more abundantly is the Christian life, to be like Christ. And they pertain to three feasts of the Lord. These feasts of the Lord... In Leviticus 23, it gives us the feast of the Lord, not the feast of the church, not the feast of Israel, but the feast of the Lord. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're partaking of his blood. This is my blood in the New Testament given for you. Another place that says the blood of the New Testament given for you. Blood in the New Testament given for you. The New Testament, for that to have power, for the, the testament or the will, a will is the testament. The New Testament is the new will of Jesus. To do the will of God, you do what the testament says or the will. Every spirit that comes to you that's not of God is of the devil. There's only two spirit, kingdom against kingdom. It didn't say kingdom, kingdom against kingdoms. It said kingdom against kingdom. That's not redundant. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Nation is all nations that come against Israel. Nation. Then kingdom against kingdom. There's only two kingdoms. A kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of God, the kingdom, the Holy Ghost, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the kingdom of the devil. The devil told Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me, and in a moment he made all the kingdoms of the world come before the Lord Jesus. 
that was a spiritual in the Lord's spirit tempted there in the wilderness. Start of his ministry after he had fasted 40 days. He said, all these I'll give you if you will bow down and worship me. Were they his to give? Yes, they're the prince of the power of the air. But Jesus was going to redeem them back by the blood. The blood covenant. The fellowship and his sufferings. To know him and the power of his resurrection is through the blood. The blood covers everything there is in God. The devil hates the blood because the blood is the life. And Jesus shed his blood. And when he shed his blood upon the cross, and we partake of the Lord's Supper, we do show forth the Lord's death. Not the life. His death. Why? Because his blood was shed on the cross. In his death, he saved us. In his dying, he saved us. The blood was shed on Calvary. The scale cap of the whole world, Golgotha. Golgol means to wheel, to roll away. Gilead, Gilead, a heap of testimony. Thank you. A heap of testimony. And the heap of testimony is the testimony of Jesus. There's no other testimony. The testimony is in the power of the blood. Somebody said, all this I've heard from my youth up. What does it mean? Well, because we have not appropriated the blood. When the lamb was slain, the paschal lamb, it was applied, the blood of that lamb was applied on the lentils, top and bottom, and the doorpost, both sides. Top, bottom, and on both sides. It covered you from head to foot and both arm lengths. And when you walked through that door, everything changed. In the house there, with the blood upon the doorpost and the lentils, from that point on, the devil couldn't get in through the power of the blood. Why would the blood have such efficacy? Why would it have so much power? What is in the blood? For all living is in the blood, the blood. So it's in the blood. For the give the life, for the lamb to give his life, he had to shed his blood. That's the reason when you go to a hospital, the first thing to do is take a blood test. Why? Because it's in the blood that shows a life, and any disease will manifest in that blood. There's an X factor in the blood. Man can make an exact hemoglobin, platelets, everything exactly like the chemicals found in the blood. A red, oozy substance looks just like the blood has the same chemicals on the periodic table and yet there's something missing you can't give a blood transfusion with it because if you do you will kill the other person why because it's called the x factor they don't know what it is that x factor is god the very breath of not only the living but the ones out there, the very breath that God gives, he holds in his hand. Every breath you take is because of God. All the substances and everything is held together by the word of his power down here. And the power is in the blood. Somebody said, why would the power be in the blood? Why would the strength be in the blood? What is the thing that the blood, that the devil cannot come through it? When it says you're filled with the Holy Ghost, it means to smear or rub, to be totally covered. With what? With the blood. From the crown of your head to the sole of the feet, your doorpost and the lintels, from the top to the bottom, and that door, Jesus is that door. When you go in, that sheepfold, no devil can come through that door. But you have a two-leave gate. A long time ago, God spoke to me that I was Cyrus. I don't want to be Cyrus. I don't want to be Cyrus. 
because Cyrus didn't know him. And that shook me. <laughs> and I said, Lord, surely this can't be Cyrus. You didn't mean Cyrus. I bet Peter, James, or John, or Paul, or he said, Cyrus. So I told Sister Beard, I said, and I was reading 8, 10, 12 hours a day for three years, and I told Sister Beard, I said, she's working her job, paying all the bills. I said, go to the library and get every book on Cyrus you can get. From his birth to his life, his death, everything. Because I've got to know what is this thing about Cyrus. And if you'll take a look with me in Isaiah 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. Verse 45, 1, Isaiah 45, 1. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. Now, it was not because Cyrus had the Holy Ghost. This is Old Testament. But every king, every prophet, and every priest was anointed of God. So they call the kings, priests, or prophets anointed of God. Because God places over the kingdom even the basis of sorts. But he did something with Cyrus different from all others. Because Cyrus gave the commandment to rebuild and restore the kingdom. For the temple to be rebuilt again was a, was a commandment of Cyrus to Ezra and Nehemiah. Whose right hand I have holding to subdue nations before him. Well, God told Adam, I want you to replenish the earth and subdue it. But it was only for one reason, to give God glory. He said, and I will loose the loins of kings. The loin is a strength. Your loins in the Lord is logos. Breastplate of righteousness. Your loins girt about with truth. That truth is logos. The helmet of salvation. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby you can quench all the fiery darts of Satan. And taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That's not logos. That's rhema. It's what you do with the word to pronounce it as it comes through you in your two-leave gate. Your lips. The sacrifices of praise, the sacrifice of the calves of our lips. So he takes that temple of Solomon that has a two-leave gate. A leave means it opens and shuts. It swings. Swings open. It's a two-leave gate. That's the oracle. Goes into the ark, the testimony. A testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. And that two-leaf gate is your mouth. You are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're not your own. You're bought with a price, bought with the precious blood of the Lamb. You're going to loose the loins of kings. The loins is the strength of kings. To loose the loins, God says, I'm going to take those strength of kings and loose them, unstrengthen them, make them putty, make their knees knock before you. When they take you before kings and magistrate, they give, he gives you a mouth, a two-leaved gate that they cannot gainsay or no resist. Notice the next one. To open before him... The two leave gates, and the gate shall not be shut. Now, what does that remind you of? Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gate shall not be shut. The oracle of the testimony will not be shut. As I pondered this many years ago, Sister Beard got every book on Cyrus there was. All the kingdoms of the world came in under him. Kings. 
In every commentary you read, it will tell you that that two-leaved gate was Babylon, and it was the gates to the city. And they always closed those gates to the city of Babylon in the natural. And Cyrus went in there, and if he had taken his army in and those gates were closed, he could not assail the city of Babylon. But the gates were open. And Cyrus marked in, marched in and destroyed them. Well, somebody said, that's it. That's a commentary on it. No, it's not. You go into commentaries, you're going to get messed up. Let the Holy Ghost speak to you. The two leave gates there that I want to talk to you about, if you'll bear with me just for a minute to let you see what kind of a temple you are. But you have to believe it. You have to occupy till he comes. It's all on us to guard our little patch and don't let the devil have it. Your, your hand has to cleave to the sword. The battle is on. The devil wants to destroy you. The two leave gates. He said, I will open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Look at 1 Kings. And uh, this takes us into the ministry of Jesus, not in the Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits, not in Shabbat, Pentecost, in the book of Acts. This takes us into the book of the Revelation in Tabernacles. This takes us into the final blood-bought tabernacle feast of the Lord. If you'll take a look at 1 Kings there, and uh, it's... And you take and see that, that as Solomon was building this temple, it was in that, not the tabernacle of Moses, that was dedicated in Passover, but Solomon's temple that was dedicated in Tishri, the seventh month, Ethneim, in the 21st day of the seventh month. Haggai the prophet said, I'll shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. All the gold and silver is mine, and I make the glory of the latter house greater than that of the former. If you take a look there at 1 Kings 6, and he talks about an oracle. He talks about the gates, the gates of the house, the... Solomon's temple, and it's, all these temples simply are you. The temple is not in temples of hands anymore, but as you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, you're not your own, but you're bought with a price. We're going to be coming right back to Leviticus 23 in just a minute. And as you look there at Kings, we have Solomon's temple dedicated in the seventh month, which will be correlating with the seventh feast of the Lord, the third season of God, the seventh feast in tabernacles. And we will see that these gates in the oracle, the gates to the oracle, that that will be the gates within the cherubim of glory and the gate there will be the same, the door, the door to the oracle of Solomon's temple. First Kings 6 will be the same gate or door when Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. It is the same as the eastern gate. One read high, one read long, one read broad. A read is six cubits. Golden read, seven cubits. What he's saying here is that the gate in the oracle of cedar, take a look at verse 16. And he built 20 cubits. 20 is the number of redemption and the sides of the house both the floor and the walls with boards of cedar. This is the cedar work. 
Now, why the cedar work? Because cedar, cedar, when in Haggai talks about the desire of all nations shall come, and when you read in Zephaniah, the second chapter, that God will uncover the cedar work. The, why is the cedar work so important? The floor of the Holy of Holies is fir. Now, this is boring you. It's because you haven't read and you don't know. You have no part of it. This is not going to be Pentecost again. This will be more sufferings. Cut me down some. That's too high. Hallelujah. It will not be Pentecost again. Everybody said the Lord told me to take a look at Acts the second chapter and get ready for it. Honey, that's already come. That's already there. We're already there. We've been there for over 2,000 years. <laughs> there is a higher level of glory. Pentecost goes in with type of the schoolmaster in Christ, which was Moses, and the law, which was schoolmaster in Christ. That, that temple of Moses, the tabernacle of Moses, that tabernacle of Moses was dedicated in Passover because it, ad, it answered to the Passover season of God in the church. That's the reason in the 14th day of the first month of Bib, on the preparation the day before, they sacrificed the Paschal lamb. The day before, before Jesus was crucified, where was he? He ate the Lord's Passover. I have desired to eat this with you. And they had a cup, and he broke bread. The devil hates this word, and you got tons of trouble on this thing. He hates this word because it's the next step in glory. It will not be Pentecost again. Passover, he said, take this bread and eat it, which is broken for you, which is my body. Well, what is that bread? John 6 said that bread is not that manna that your fathers did eat from heaven and are dead. Manna, what is it? They ate angels' food. But Jesus said, this is not the bread that you'll eat. The bread that I give is my body that came from heaven. John 6 said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You have no life. Now the thing is, what, what blood? What bread? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Do we go back and build again the former things, the first principles or oracles of God? The doctrines of baptism, laying on the hands, the resurrection, eternal judgment, this will do if God permit. Let us go on to perfection. Hebrews 6. Therefore, when he said, this is my, this is that bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat and are dead, but the living bread that came down from heaven, which of a man eat. That living bread is Jesus. It is God himself. It's the spirit of God that you partake of. God wants not only your spirit, But he wants to permeate your soul as well to bring his nature in you in the soul realm. Whereby given exceeding great and precious promises, whereby we're able to escape the corruption of the world through lust, that we might be made partakers of his divine nature. The nature is not in your spirit. The nature is in your soul realm. Mind, will, emotions, imagination, and intellect. And when it's in the soul realm, it will automatically manifest in your body, your fleshly body. You won't be sick. You will not be diseased. No sickness or devil. Somebody said, well, it can hit you. I didn't say it, can hit, it could, couldn't hit you. But every spirit that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he said that 
Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and all that were what? Oppressed of the devil. Is sickness of God. Bear the burden, brother. God's getting glorified in it. No, it's not. Sickness does not glorify God. Sickness and disease. He was bruised. He was uh, bruised for iniquity. Chastisement of our, of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we were healed. Peter says, First Peter, you were healed. By his stripes, you were healed. You are healed. So it went from you were healed in Isaiah to you are healed in First Peter. So 3 John 2 becomes into being. For God wishes above all things that thou mayest prosper. That doesn't mean money. Not only in the physical realm, it means in the spiritual realm. That thou mayest prosper and be in health. How? Even as thy soul prospers. That means when you take in on that a divine nature of God, walk as he walked, talk as he talked, live as he lived, walk in exact footsteps that you are guaranteed to prosper and be in health even as, our, as your soul prospers. That's nature. Nature is character. Are you born with character or is character built? It's built. It is experience and character is built in the person. The body of Christ he desires not only when you are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins the heart the conscience the conscience is purged from dead works how by the blood of Jesus the conscience is in the spirit of man so it becomes purged from dead works to serve the living God now the communion the conscience and then the communion allows us to have communion with the Holy Ghost. We get the Holy Ghost. But all of a sudden, does that automatically make God? I don't have any more bad thoughts. All of a sudden, if he was our biggest cusser and a brawler and a fighter, does he stop? If he liked apple pie before, does all of a sudden now he likes matzah? You know, unleavened bread, and that's all he eats because that's what the Jews ate? No. All then, the soul has not been changed. The Spirit has. The Spirit has received the Holy Ghost. The old church of the living God, Peter, James, John, Paul, all of them spoke of sanctify yourself holy, both spirit, and they didn't stop there, soul and body. Why? Because the Holy Ghost then starts moving through the, uh, the person's spirit, conscience, Communion, intuition. The more you read the Word of God, it's not held in your brain. It's held. You read, and they say, you can only preach, Brother Beard, for 30 minutes because all that the mind, that's all the mind can conceive and hold and believe. So if you go over 30 minutes, the mind just can't comprehend it. <clears throat> oh, yeah? Well, we're not feeding your mind. Paul preached all night long. The services in God are going to go in the last days just like it did before except longer. And they're going to go all day, all night, all day, all night. There will be a continual church services with no shutting down of the doors. The two leave gates will not be shut. The oracle of God will be going 24-7, 365. Thank <laughs> you.